Good afternoon, everybody. So I want to begin by sharing some news on how President Biden is fighting for working families and lowering costs by taking on corporate ripoffs. Ahead of his State of the Union address, the President is convening his Competition Council this afternoon to announce new actions to crack down on hidden junk fees and promote competition. President Biden is establishing a new strike force co-chaired by the Justice Department and Federal Trade Commission to crack down on illegal pricing. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is slashing credit card late fees from an average of $32 down to $8. This will save consumers $10 billion a year, an average savings of $220 for the 45 million people who are charged late fees each year. The Department of Agriculture is finalizing a rule to protect small farmers and ranchers. The Federal Communications Commission is circulating a proposed rule that would ban bulk billing. Helping lower internet costs and increase choices, our administration's action to ban hidden junk fees will save Americans more than $20 billion a year. The President will make clear in his State of the Union that he will continue fighting to lower costs for families. I have some news we'd like to share with all of you. On March 15th, President Joe Biden will host Taoiseach Lee Varadkar of Ireland for a bilateral meeting followed by a, St. by a St. Patrick's Day celebration at the White House on March 17th, continuing a long-standing St. Patrick's Day tradition. The leaders will reaffirm the close and enduring partnership between the United States and Ireland and the extraordinary bonds between our people. They will discuss our country's shared commitment to continue supporting Ukraine in the face of Russia's brutal aggression, as well as our cooperation on a range of other global issues. They will reaffirm their steadfast support for the Belfast Good Friday Agreement as we welcome the, the recent restoration of Northern Ireland's executive and assembly. Vice President Kamala Harris and the second gentleman, Douglas Emhoff, will also host the Taoiseach and Mr. Matthew Barrett for a breakfast at the Naval Observatory on March 15th. And as you can see, when I walked out, three of our amazing Wranglers came out with me. And so before we get started uh, with the briefing, I have a couple of things that I want to say. Um, so, you know, they're moving up in the world. Uh, they're going to stay in the family, but still moving up. And it's so well-deserved of all three into new roles, obviously. Allison Bayless has been by my side since day one and a rock star wrangler. I'm gonna get emotional for the last two years is uh, is a moving over to the to the campaign. Uh, there is no one who works harder uh, or more hours than on our team than Allison. As you, can, as you can all attest by the hours of the day that she responds to your emails, she accomplishes everything with diligence and composure, and she always has a bright, bright sunshine spirit, uh, even when, we, even I'm in, when in, my, in my dark spaces, as we tend to joke around. Um, and she has a, an incredible sense of humor and a wit uh, that is unmatched. Silas Woods has, has the biggest heart. Uh, of everyone that I know. And sometimes I worry about him because he has such a big heart. Uh, and every single day I see him go above and beyond to coordinate movements, uh, get you all what you need, and make accommodations for everyone as he, as he can. And some of you don't know he's often the reason you're able to get that shot, right? Silas is really good at getting that shot, shot uh, get in the room, or hear what the president has to say, obviously. Uh, there isn't a single person here who doesn't have a kind word to say about Silas, and there's no better teammate, uh, which is why the second gentleman is uh, stealing him from us. Uh, he came from OVP, so now he's going back essentially to that world. Uh, the press team won't be the same without Silas, uh, but we're glad we'll still get to work with him every day. I'm gonna miss you very much, Silas. Literally the biggest heart of anyone that I know. And finally, Davis, uh, Davis Conger came to us from the State Department, having traveled the world with Secretary Blinken. He's brought skill and professionalism to our team, and he's, and he's someone you always know you can rely on. Every day he has brought competence, kindness, and coolness under pressure to his job. He's always so even cool, even keel and cool, which is why Annie Tomasini 
has hired him as an advisor in the office of the deputy chief of staff. Three, three incredible new roles for three incredible young people. We're extraordinarily proud of all of you, the work you've done, and the work you will now continue to do at a higher level, obviously on behalf of this president. Um, and so I am super, super proud of you. You guys are like uh, like my kids who are flying out, flying off. Uh, so I'm glad you will still be part of the broader team, obviously. And I'm really, really sad to see all of you go. But I am so personally, personally proud of all of you. And now they're going to get up and they're going to walk out because there's so much work to do, as you know, as Wranglers. Uh, but thank you guys. Love you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Uh, with that, Admiral John Kirby is here to give an update on the Middle East. And Admiral, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this morning, I think you all are tracking the Department of Defense conducted another airdrop of humanitarian assistance into Gaza. Three U.S. C-130s dropped 60 bundles with a total of more than 36,000 meals uh, ready to eat. Uh, we were joined in this endeavor by several Jordanian aircraft as well. As President Biden has said, this will be a part of a sustained effort while our, with our international partners to scale up the amount of life-saving aid that we're getting into Gaza. And as I said last week, we're exploring other channels to get aid into Gaza, including a maritime route. To that end, we're looking at both military and commercial options to move assistance by sea. There's still an awful lot of work that's being done on this to flesh it out. Of course, we're also going to continue to urge Israel to facilitate more trucks and more routes, opening up more crossings so that more aid can get into people in need and increase that flow. Um, and with that, take some questions. Okay, good answer. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, with that number on the, the 36,000 meals, uh, was that just the U.S. Contrib uh, contribution to that, or was that also the Jordanian contribution to that area? That was just the U.S. Uh, the Jordanians flew, I believe it was four aircraft, and um, I, I can get you the exact number of how much they dropped, but it was, it was food that they dropped, too. And then in terms of the scale of that, I mean, that's a, a drop in the bucket of, of what the need oh, is certainly. in Gaza got, got right now. So you talked about the, the maritime corridor planning as well. I mean, this war's been going on for for you know, five months now. Yeah. Uh, why isn't the U.S. and its allies further along in the planning stages for a maritime corridor or other operations like an airdrop with more, equi with more equipment, more resources, more personnel on standby? Should, you know, the, for the moment the president gave the, the go-ahead, I mean, shouldn't there have been more contingency planning to get more aid in much faster? We've been working on the humanitarian assistance front since the beginning, as you said, many months ago. Um, and quite frankly, the best and most efficient way to get aid in to people in a confined space like that in a very urban environment is on the ground. I mean, uh, yes, you can move more volume in, in ships, whether they're military or commercial ships, but eventually that stuff has to get ashore, then has to get loaded onto vehicles and then trucked in, right? So the trucks are the best way to do that, and that's why we've been working so hard to, to try to increase the flow. And during the week-long pause that we had before, we were able to get it up to 200 trucks a day. It was through President Biden's urging that, uh, that we got the Rafa cross crossing open to aid. It was at his urging that we got Karim Shalom open. Uh, but it just hasn't, the flow just hasn't been enough to meet the need. And as the war has progressed, the need has gotten obviously much more dire. So um, it's not like we, even though we're just now talking about airdrops, it's not like the idea of airdrops just, just happened, just dropped out of the sky. It's been something we've been talking about for quite some time in the maritime route as well. The maritime route, uh, yes, it can move more volume. Uh, at sea, but it also is going to require a uh, heavier logistics lift and some infrastructure ashore and very much going to need the support of uh, allies and partners. And so those discussions are ongoing. And then does the president have any plans to meet with Benny Gantz before he leaves Washington this evening? No. Uh, thank you for answering that one. Right. So we can go yes. and move on. No, from uh, a few others here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the president this morning signaled that he's concerned about violence in Jerusalem and in the region in the coming days. Is there something specific he's been told to anticipate? I, I won't speak to specific uh, in, intelligence one way or the other, Ed. I mean, obviously, this is something we're, we're always mindful of, particularly given um, uh, what's gone on uh, between Israel and Hamas. But I, I don't think I'm going to elaborate on that. There, uh, just to backtrack on something from last week, I don't think you've been asked about this, at least on camera, but when he was in New York, and suggested he had reason to believe there'd be a ceasefire by Monday, and that hasn't happened. Uh, 
Why did he think that at the time? He was referring to updates and briefings that he'd been getting from the national security team about the progress of negotiations. Uh, obviously, we'd all uh, wish that that had happened. Um, we wish that it would happen today, but we're still we're still negotiating. We're still trying to get there. And on Haiti, uh, is the U.S. continuing to monitor that situation, and does it have any sense of the whereabouts of the prime minister? Yes. As far as I understand, no. Uh, I'll let the prime minister speak to his travel, uh, but I, I'm not aware that we have any keen sense of what, what his whereabouts are. Yeah, Thanks. Uh, just following up on Haiti, uh, you've called on Americans to evacuate. How should they do that when the airport is under attack? We, uh, again, I'd refer you to the State Department. Uh, to, uh, they're the ones that issued that, uh, that advisory. Um, not a safe time for Americans to be uh, in, in Haiti right now. Um, there are other ways uh, to leave. Uh, again, uh, let the State Department do that. They're, they're in touch with uh, or ma are making themselves available to Americans who are there and want to want to get that information. You said yesterday that you're working to expedite this multinational force <coughs> led by Kenya uh, to deploy to Haiti as soon as possible. They've said that uh, they're ready to deploy within 72 hours. The holdup is funding, in part U.S. funding that was pledged by the administration that's being held up, as we understand it, by Republicans in Congress. How urgent are those conversations, and uh, how are you going to expedite it if you've got this, this key hold up? Yeah, I'm not sure that that simplistic explanation is exactly uh, accurate, that that, 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 that that is the only thing holding this up. But let's put that, but let's put that aside. Um, you're right. We're going to need some. We're going to need some support, and we are working actively with members of Congress. I mean, we. I think. I think we. We can all recognize that this is in our interest as well as the region's interest, and certainly the interest of the Haitian people uh, to get a more stable, calm, secure environment there. So, just one last follow-up. If if that's a simplistic explanation, then what what is the holdup? Uh, again, we, there's. They've are Kenya's already agreed to to do this. That's a big first step. Um, and we're working with Kenya, we're working with other partners to see if we can get this multinational security uh, uh, mission uh, up and running as soon as possible. I just don't have any more updates for you than that. Uh, thanks, Admiral. Thanks, Green. You had said yesterday that part of the reason why it's so hard to get aid into Gaza is in some cases because of the Israeli war cabinet. Is that acceptable? There's nothing acceptable about the dire situation on the ground in, in Gaza in terms of the lack of food, lack of water, lack of medicine, in some cases a lack of fuel. That shouldn't be acceptable to anybody. So short answer to your question is no, it's not acceptable. And that's why we continue to work with our Israeli counterparts. As I said in my opening statement, and you've heard the president say as well, and the vice president, that it's time for Israel to open up more crossings and allow more aid in. And on the vice president, there were reports that the National Security Council had asked her to, quote, tone down her speech on Sunday. What can you say about that? I would point you to what the vice president's spokesperson already said about that story and calling it inaccurate. Does the administration still believe it's more effective to withhold public criticism of Netanyahu in order to have more sway in private? And is that private sway well, waning? Just, I don't think I'm going to accept the premise of that question. I mean, we have been nothing but uh, uh, candid and forthright in private with our Israeli counterparts and certainly uh, in public in the comments that we have made. You've heard again from the president and the vice president just recent days um, expressing very clearly what our concerns are with the humanitarian situation in there and how it is unacceptable and how uh, we need the Israelis to step up and do more. And just lastly, Hamas said today they won't accept a deal that does not include a complete withdrawal of Israeli troops from Gaza. Is that realistic? And if not, where do negotiations go from here? I ain't going to negotiate in public. Uh, we, uh, we've been working this real hard. Uh, as you heard from President Biden just today, uh, that we're still hopeful we can get there, but uh, nothing is done until everything is done, and not everything is done in terms of this negotiation. So what we're looking for and what we want, temporary ceasefire for about six weeks. That'll allow us to get more aid in, and more importantly, get all those hostages back with their families where they belong, and reduce the violence. That's the deal on the table. And as the President also said today, it's a rational deal, and the Israelis have been cooperating. They have been negotiating in good faith on this. It's time for Hamas to step up to the plate, take a swing, and let's get this thing done. The Hamas is saying <coughs> that they have now extended a deal that Israel has not responded to. Israel is saying that Hamas has to accept 
the deal that you've been referencing with regard to hostages. What's, can you sort out what's true in both of those things? And, and can you also comment on, has it been more difficult to have these talks in Cairo without an Israeli representative at the table? I kind of sort of already did it, Jeff, but I'll, I'll, I'll maybe I'll take it a, a different way. There has been, throughout the process of these many weeks, back and forth between the sides, proposals, counterproposals. And, uh, and haggling over the details and all the modalities of how this is going to work in terms of the phasing of the hostages and how many and, um, and the release of Palestinian prisoners and how many and how that's all going to take place. Um, there is now a framework. There is a deal, as the president said today, that has been the result of all this back and forth. So the back and forth has happened. There's a deal now. And the onus is on Hamas to accept it. And you had a second question. Israel hasn't been at the table. Oh, and in, in Cairo. Again, I won't speak to Israel and the presence or, 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 of their negotiators when they get to speak to that. But as I said earlier, the Israelis have negotiated in good faith. They have agreed to this framework. That they, they have taken it uh, right up to the end. And now it's up to Hamas. Given that Hamas has now responded to the to the deal and that they have not agreed to it as written, is it still practically possible to come up with an agreement by the start of Ramadan? That, that, look, the negotiators are working hard on this, Kevin. That's what we, we hope will happen, but we'll have to see. So you, there's, there is still a belief that that is a possibility? I didn't say a belief. I said we hope that we can get this done as soon as possible. We would have liked to have this done two, three weeks ago, if not before then. Um, we are where we are, and we're working on this really, really hard. And given what the president said about the potential dangerous situation should an agreement not be reached, what conversations is the White House having with Israel about, for example, the situation around the Alaska mosque? Uh, what, what are sort of the in, conversations in advance to try and curb some of the violence that the I don't think the Israelis need, need to be reminded by the United States that they live in a tough neighborhood. And I don't think they need to be reminded about um, uh, uh, the prospect of, of violence, particularly in a sensitive time like Ramadan. They, they don't need us to remind them of that. They're, they're well aware of it. Um, again, we're, we're going to continue to work with them as we have to help sure, make sure that they can defend themselves against Hamas, make sure that the Israelis, the Israeli citizens uh, are safe and secure as much as possible, uh, and that we can try to get this hostage deal in place. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Hey, thanks, Corrine. Uh, John, why isn't President Biden meeting with Benny Gantz while he's in Washington? Mr. Gantz uh, asked to come to Washington uh, and uh, asked for a series of meetings with administration officials, and he's getting those. He met with Jake Sullivan yesterday. Uh, he met with the Vice President yesterday. Today, he's met with the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State. All of these conversations have been constructive and productive. And uh, uh, we hope that Mr. Gantz uh, goes home uh, uh, informed by uh, the conversations that we had and the concerns that we expressed. I mean, was it a scheduling issue with the president being in Camp David, or was it? Mr. Gantz had a chance to meet with senior levels all the way up to the vice president of the United States. Um, and, uh, and, you know, again, we think these, con these conversations were constructive and productive and, uh, and hope that he goes home uh, informed by them. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, the president and the vice president, and, and you, uh, for that matter, have both said that uh, the situation with getting aid into Gaza is too difficult. The vice president said that Israel needs to allow more aid in. Uh, no excuses. Uh, what is preventing the president from communicating to the Israeli government that if they don't allow aid, we will not continue supplying weapons? Why is that not a fair trade? No aid, no bombs. Because the president still believes that it's important for Israel to have what it needs to defend itself against a still viable Hamas threat. Maybe some people have forgotten what happened on the 7th of October, but President Biden has not. How does keeping aid out of Gaza contribute to Israel's right to defend itself? Keeping aid out of Gaza is not the right thing for any purpose. It's not about... It, it, it's just it's just not acceptable on the face of it, as I told Selena. And that's why we're working more than any other country, by the way, to increase the flow. I mean, it is U.S. aircraft that are dropping these this food out of the sky in the last couple of days. Yes, but you, you keep saying, and you said yesterday, the holdup, that the problem is the lack of capacity being delivered on the ground. 
and that's that's the Israelis and to some extent the Egyptians, but mostly the Israelis. How is that? And you said it's not acceptable earlier. But you're looking at this as a zero-sum game. Like, yes, you are, sir. It's, uh, well, if they're not doing what you want, then cut off the aid so they can't defend themselves. That's not the way we're going to do this. It's not the way we have done this. They have a right to defend themselves. They need the capabilities. Anyway, let me finish. They need the capabilities to do that. There's, there's aid that's desperately in need. And you know what? We can do that, too. We can do both. Both are important, and both are going to be pursued by this administration. I, don't, I know you don't approve of necessarily the policy choices that we've made, but... But, but we, and I'm answering them, we can do both. We can influence our Israeli counterparts to do more, to be more careful, to let more aid in, and we can continue to work to get that aid in ourselves. And one more follow-up then. Uh, Israel, according to Israeli media, uh, the Israeli Defense Forces and industrial base uh, are ramping up or preparing to ramp up domestic production of weapons that are currently U.S. supplied, including uh, dumb bombs, uh, firearms, that sort of thing, to be uh, uh, to be commenced next year, 2025. Is the president concerned that this would lower uh, U.S. leverage? And is there, is there a window that's closing during which the U.S. has the uh, leverage and influence to get the Israeli government to do certain things with respect to human rights? for instance, allowing more aid into Gaza. The president's concern, as I said, about Israel being able to defend itself against a still viable threat. We'll let the Israelis speak to their defense industrial base plans and intentions. They're a sovereign country. They get to make those decisions, and we respect that. They're also a key ally and a partner, and we respect that alliance and that partnership as well. The other thing that's keeping the president up at night is the humanitarian assistance and the humanitarian situation on the ground in Gaza, and that's why uh, he has uh, ordered these airdrops. That's why we continue to urge very, very stridently the Israelis to open up more crossings on the ground to supplement the, to supplement the aid that's already getting in and to try to improve what's not getting in. And that's why, as I said in my opening statement, the president also has the team looking at maritime options. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to ask you about some remarks the French President Emmanuel Macron made today. So he urged Ukraine's allies not to be cowards, and he also added that not, he... Not, not to be what? Cowards, oh, cowards, coward. cowards, I'm sorry. sorry, my accent. And um, he added that he fully stood behind those controversial remarks he made last week about sending troops to Ukraine. So what do you make of this uh, rhetoric? Uh, do you think the time has come for stronger language on Ukraine, or is this not helpful? I, I'm not going to parse uh, President Macron's uh, words. I mean, he certainly uh, has every right and ability to, to speak for himself and his views. All I can do is speak for President Biden, the Commander-in-Chief, and the President has been clear. We have been extraordinarily strong in leading international efforts to support Ukraine for the last two years. We need Congress to help right now and pass that supplemental so we can continue that strong leadership and support um, a coalition of more than 50 nations that the United States put together to support Ukraine. He's also been very clear since the very beginning uh, of this uh, war. There's not going to be U.S. troops on the ground fighting inside Ukraine. And you know what? President Zelensky isn't asking for that. He's just asking for the tools and capabilities. He's never asked for foreign troops to fight for his country. He, he and his troops want to do that, but they need the tools, and that's what we need the help of. We're bumping up against the President's table. Sorry. Thank you, Corinne. Um, I have questions on the Indonesian election, but just to finish up on Gaza, is the uh, dance meeting with the VP and also with Jake a signal that the administration is looking forward to a future Israeli government without Netanyahu? No. Um, and maybe this one is for Grin. Will the president use any part of his State of the Union address to acknowledge the anger of American Arabs and Muslims and progressive Democrats and explain to them why he's not imposing conditionalities on Israel? I'm going to go around and I'll I'll get to that question. Let me just get to a couple more people. Okay. Right, great. And so just uh, on, the Indian, on, on the Indonesian election, China, the United Kingdom, Australia, and several other countries have uh, congratulated Indonesia's president-elect Prabowo Subianto on his apparent victory. Is there a reason why the administration is waiting? We congratulate the Indonesian people on a successful election. The president looks forward to 
early engagement with the new administration and to strengthening our cooperation under what is already a strategic partnership. We're obviously closely following the ongoing vote count, and we understand that, that Minister Subianto has a significant lead. Uh, we've had excellent cooperation with him since the time he was defense minister, and um, you know, if he is in fact finally elected, then we look forward to continuing that relationship. Just to clarify, the president-elect does have a long track <coughs> record of uh, allegations of human rights violations. He was at one point the son-in-law of former President Suharto, who ruled Indonesia for 32 years. And his vice president-elect is the son of the outgoing president, Joko Widodo. Is the administration concerned at all about democratic backsliding in Indonesia? We're never back, we never uh, back away from our concerns about the need for human rights, civil rights, um, uh, and all the values of democratic institutions. And the president absolutely will not shy away about expressing our concerns. Okay. Admiral, uh, to ask that question more directly, or one of the other questions that was just asked, in Israel, the vice president's meeting with Gantz was seen as a snub for the Netanyahu government, was it? The meeting with Minister Gantz, again, was at his request. He is a member of the War Cabinet. There is a war going on, and we believed uh, it, would, uh, it was a good opportunity to have a discussion with the War Cabinet about the way in which we're supporting Israel and the things that we want to see Israel do. The President was asked this morning uh, how his relationship was with Netanyahu these days, and he responded, like it's always been, and then he smiled. Yep. <laughs> I don't know if I can improve upon that. What would you add to that? I wouldn't. Yeah. Right, one question, one question I still Haiti. like my job. <laughs> one question on Haiti. The administration has provided more than $126 million in humanitarian aid to Haiti in 2023. Where has that money gone? And is it, has it been effective? I can get you, Gabe. I'll get you, we can get you a rundown of exactly how that, those funds were allocated. But uh, we are, we're proud of the humanitarian assistance that we have and will continue to provide Haiti. But the, right now, Man, right now, the focus has got to be on getting that multinational security element in there to help create the conditions where the people of Haiti can live free in, 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 in security so that humanitarian assistance can get there more freely and, and get to the people that need it. Last question. Thanks, Green. Thanks, Admiral. Um, following up on Aurelia's question, um, there's been some pushback on Macron's comments from the Germans and also from the Swedes as well. Is the U.S. worried that Ukraine's allies are starting to splinter? No, there's been tremendous uh, international support and unity uh, uh, for Ukraine. Um, uh, as you know, we met with the Prime Minister of Italy just last week. Uh, they've been strong. Uh, there's, there's incredible unity. Uh, everybody uh, shares the same concerns that we do about just letting Putin take Ukraine and what that means for their safety and security and for the security of, of the NATO alliance. No, no, we're not concerned about that. The, the stalling of this USA is putting more pressure on European allies and causing fractures on, at all in that. Sense. We're worried that the delay on the national security supplemental and the assistance coming from the United States is going to have a detriment, actually already is having a detrimental effect for Ukrainian soldiers on the battlefield. That's the main concern. And the time is way past now to get them the tools that they need to defend themselves. Their defensive lines are starting to shift now, going in the wrong direction, because the Russians continue to push west out of the Donbass. Thanks, thanks, Alvin. All right. As you know, the president's uh, event's going to start shortly. Zeke, do you have anything? Um, yeah, could you give us a broad rundown of how the president spent the last few days at Camp David preparing for the State of the Union? Who was with him? Uh, does he have a final speech text at this point? So, as you know, um, the president has been working on, as you just stated in your, in your uh, question to me, the State of the Union uh, address for the past several days. I'm not going to get into uh, any specifics as to who is with him. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a moment that's incredibly important to him. Obviously, he's going to be not just addressing Congress, but also millions of Americans who are going to be tuning in. And uh, he's looking forward to that, to talking about the, accomplish the accomplishments that he's made the last three years and also the vision, the vision that he he has uh, for this country, obviously for the American people. I'm just not going to get into any specifics or details. We'll have certainly more to share with you all tomorrow uh, as we get closer. You know, the State of the Union address is incredibly important. He's going to be working on it, uh, I believe, until the very last minute. So he gets it just right because uh, it's going to be an important moment. Uh, but don't have anything beyond that. You heard me talk about the Competition Council, how that is part of the President talking about wanting to focusing on um, uh, lowering costs for the American people. Obviously, he's going to talk about our democracy, our fr freedoms, right, fighting, continue to fight for that, uh, 
reproductive freedom, how that is an issue uh, that the American people truly care about. You're going to hear him talk about that. Uh, and so there's a lot of issues in front, uh, obviously in front of the American people that they care and they want to hear directly from the president about. And so that's what he's going to focus on. We'll certainly have more to share as we get closer to Thursday. A different topic, I was a bit of a kerfuffle this morning uh, across Lafayette Park at the Department of Federal Affairs. I'm running an effort to ban the display of that <coughs> that iconic uh, Times Square kiss photo on, on BJA at the end of World War II. Um, was anyone at the White House uh, consulted uh, in that in the drafting of the initial memorandum? And then did anyone at the White House call up the Secretary of Veterans Affairs and say rescind that memo? So uh, just so I want to be really, really clear. The, uh, the VA is not going to be banning this photo from uh, VA facilities. So I just want to be super, super clear about that. I know, as you just said, uh, you described it as a kerfuffle. Uh, there was uh, obviously some reporting on that. I can say that uh, uh, I can definitely say that the memo was not sanctioned. Uh, and so it's not something that we were even aware of until you all started reporting on it. Uh, but uh, we are not banning that photo. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to be super clear about that. Any specifics about the memo and the process over there, certainly I would refer to the VA. Well, once you were made aware of it and after, that, after the memo sort of spread on social media, did the White House direct the Veterans Affairs Secretary to rescind it? I, I believe the VA Secretary made a statement on this, so I refer you to did the you statement. Did he his own volition? Uh, 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 yes, he did that on his own volition, uh, but uh, he, I would refer you to his statement and just re, I'm really reiterating what the VA said, the VA Secretary said that it will not be, that particular photo will not be banned uh, from any facility, uh, VA facility, so I want to be very, very clear about that. Uh, okay, good. Thank you, Corrine. President Biden has said a possible endorsement by Taylor Swift is classified. <laughs> How disappointed is he that she is telling people to vote, but not for him? Going to be very careful. We're talking about 2024. Um, and uh, so I can't comment on what Taylor Swift is saying or not saying. I have no idea. I've not seen those statements. Uh, and I'll just, uh, I'll just leave it there. Okay. Be mindful. Different topic. How is President Biden going to fix the border? if he can go years without talking to the head of Border Patrol? Uh, he was literally just with the head, the chief of the Border Patrol, just this past Thursday in Brownsville, Texas. You all reported it. You all saw it. He was with, uh, he was with the chief, Chief Owens, I believe. The chief who was in charge for two years before that said, I've never had one conversation with the president or the vice president. How is that possible? So one thing I will say about Chief, uh, you're talking about Chief Ortiz. This is Chief Ortiz. Yeah. So he was invited, I believe, to participate in the president's first trip uh, visit to El Paso, which was back in January of 2023, and he did not attend. He was invited, but he was invited. He, is, he did not attend. What I can say is that you saw you saw the president with the present chief, which I think is important because we are dealing with challenges at the border because the president has taken make that a priority, worked with the Senate in a bipartisan way to come up with a way to move forward on the border, on immigration. Republicans rejected it because of what the former president, Donald Trump, told them to do, told them to reject that uh, proposal. So the president is going to continue to be steadfast, focus on an issue that majority of the American people care about, which is the border. Let's not forget, if that policy had went into law, uh, it would have been the toughest and the fairest uh, bipartisan border security agreement in decades, in decades. And last one, yeah. will President Biden publicly address Lake and Riley's murder, allegedly at the hands of an illegal immigrant who was released by law enforcement multiple times on Thursday night? I know he's got a statement, but what about at the State of the Union? Look, let me, I, I do want, this is such a tragic uh, story and uh, obviously situation. Um, this is someone's life that was lost, so I do want to always acknowledge and extend our deepest condolences uh, to, to her family and to her friends and the people who, who loved her. And so want to always be sure to say that and, uh, because it's so tragic. Uh, look, um, I don't have anything to share about the President's speech as it relates to that particular question that you have. Uh, but we, you know, we want to always, uh, always be sure that we left, lift up the families who have lost their loved ones in that way. And I would reiterate, you just asked me um, about the Border Patrol uh, chief. The president was just there with the current chief, uh, Owens. The president went to uh, the border, obviously, Bronville's, Texas, to lift up the importance of doing something, of doing something at the border. And 
I would be remiss if I did not continue to say that Republicans rejected a bipartisan proposal that came out of the Senate. And so if they truly, truly cared about what was going on at the border, if they truly cared about this immigration policies and trying to fix that, trying to move forward in a step, in a way where we have a tough and fair uh, law, they would work with us on it. They wouldn't listen to the former president who is clearly telling them to reject, telling Republicans to reject it for their, for his own political gain. And that's shameful. That's truly shameful. Okay, Selena. Will the president be watching the election results come in tonight? So, as you know, the president's going to be talking about the competition council today. Um, he is continuing to work, uh, obviously, on his State of the Union address because it's important to him. He knows how important it is for the American people to hear directly from him. Uh, I don't have uh, I don't have anything to share. I've not spoken to him about uh, his plans tonight. Obviously, he will be kept updated, uh, and he'll he'll be uh, aware of what's going on uh, tonight as. Um, uh, as, as we see uh, elections happening across the country. I just don't have anything specific on that. And the Consumer Bankers Association has been very critical of the Biden administration's rule to cut the credit card late fees. They called it anything but a win for consumers and knowingly putting consumers' financial health at risk. What's the administration's response to that criticism? So I totally dis we totally disagree, obviously. Uh, the president has always been very, very clear uh, he's going to do everything that he can to make sure that we're lower cost uh, for the American people. And what we're seeing is that uh, we're seeing, you know, uh, uh, corporations obviously not passing along their gains uh, to Americans, to American consumers, and we've always been very clear about that. Uh, and so we want to make sure that uh, uh, we protect, we protect Americans. We want to make sure that we obviously protect American consumers. So we disagree with that sentiment. We disagree uh, with that statement. And the president's always going to put the American people first. Uh, Kareem, does the White House have a position or a comment on the latest bill in Congress to crack down on TikTok, which was introduced today, I believe? So I have not seen the text or had an opportunity to speak to our um, Office of Ledger Affairs or any uh, anyone else in uh, in the in the um, in the White House office. So I don't want to get ahead of myself and speak to that. Obviously, we'll take a look as we normally do on any legislation that believe will uh, will uh, will be beneficial to the American people. I just can't speak to that at this time. Okay, Kevin. Uh, Robert Hur is supposed to testify that a week from today. Has the White House made a decision on releasing the transcripts of the president's interview? I would refer you to the, my colleagues at the White House Counsel's Office. Okay. And the Dartmouth basketball team has become the first college sports team to vote to form a union. Uh, does the White House think that that's a good idea? Is that a smart move for uh, college athletes? So, look, I'm going to obviously let, um, let uh, teams uh, make their decisions for themselves. We're not going to uh, weigh in on that. As you know, the president's a union guy. Uh, we say that all the time, but I'm not going to comment on any particular team or actions that they're taking. That's for them to decide. Uh, Green, Senator Sinema just announced that she's not running for re-election. She's going to retire from this term. I'm wondering if the White House has any comment on that. So I have not seen that. Uh, obviously, that is news, uh, uh, news to me. Um, look, we have had... Uh, opportunities to work closely with the senator on some really key important bills. She was uh, leading, uh, one of the leading negotiators on the border security uh, bill that came out of the Senate in a bipartisan way. We appreciated her efforts on that. Uh, and there are some other, obviously, ways that we've worked closely uh, with her. Outside of that, I don't want to get uh, too far ahead. I, this is the first time I'm hearing the news. Uh, but uh, she's been a partner uh, with us on many critical issues that matter to the American people. And I think that's important. Is there any um, anything you can tell us about the president's travel after the State of the Union this weekend and, and next week? Uh, I think the the bless you. <laughs> Uh, I believe the campaign has made some announcements on some travel that the president will be doing after the State of the Union, so I would refer you uh, to them. It is uh, common that after a State of the Union, the president uh, goes around and uh, goes around the country uh, to speak directly to the American people. You're going to see the president do the same, uh, but I would refer you to the campaign on specific stops that he has coming up. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the meta um, breakdown this morning, hundreds of thousands of users. Do you have any more information on that and whether it's connected to a cyber attack? So uh, obviously we all are aware of what happened uh, for the last couple of hours, the incident. Uh, and so uh, 
so don't have anything at this time. Uh, we, are, we are not aware of any specific uh, malicious cyber activity, so I can say that, or any specific nexus uh, as it relates to today's election, uh, but uh, we would have to refer you to the individual uh, social, uh, social platforms, obviously, for any more information on that. Quick separate one, on the minibus spending agreement in Congress right now, it would divert about $45 million in fees from the Justice Department's antitrust division. So I'm just wondering, given the administration's take on antitrust, is this a concern that that money would be going away? Uh, so look, um, as it relates more broadly, uh, you know, um, uh, well, I'll say this. Uh, you know, the president obviously strongly supports uh, funding for antitrust enforcement, uh, which is critical to promoting competition and lowering cost uh, for consumers. It's a, this is a bit more complicated, so I just want to break this down a little bit. The antitrust funding proposed in the funding bill is, is a 4% increase over the last year and a 26% increase since 2021. Uh, because of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, every agency is subject to budget caps, so preventing us from fully funding uh, programs the way we want to. These full year uh, bills represent a compromise, obviously. This is what has come together with these uh, with these um, uh, uh, six different bills. So no, no one got everything they wanted, obviously. That's what a compromise is. Uh, but they fund the government, prevent a damaging shutdown, and protect our progress and that's what happens when you come with a when you come forward with a compromise a bipartisan compromise okay is uh, president aware or have any concern about the number of super tuesday states that have campaigns um for uncommitted votes ceasefire write-ins uh, essentially a vote against the president because of his stance in the long so look i'm going to be super super mindful these are obviously uh people are are are, are voting right now and i cannot speak to any upcoming uh, uh, election or um, as voting as voting is happening, so going to be super super careful about that. But what I will say is what I said last time uh, when I was asked about uh, Michigan specifically. Uh, the president thinks it's important uh, for uh, people for Americans uh, to voice their opinions, to have their voices heard. Uh, he thinks that's incredibly important. We understand uh, how painful. Uh, this moment is for many Americans, for many communities. Uh, obviously, the Arab uh, and um, uh, the Arab community, the Muslim community, more specifically, uh, and so we get that. Uh, but I just want to be super careful and not speak to uh, upcoming upcoming election, upcoming voting that uh, voting that's happening right now. To be more specific, I, I know you had a, I know you had a similar question. Also, the message that the president will be saying during the State of the Union, and then I think you mentioned to my colleague that he will be taking this message. Uh, around the country after the address. Is Michigan one of those destinations? So not going to get into uh, the states. I know that the campaign announced a couple of states already uh, that he's going to be going to right after uh, Thursday. Uh, so you could expect the president uh, to be visiting multiple states across the country in the next, obviously, couple of months. Uh, not going to get into that. Uh, I would refer you to the campaign specifically on the most uh, upcoming uh, states, the announcements that they've made. Uh, and I just kind of laid out um, uh, you know, what the president has been very clear about, the understanding of how people should have the right uh, to voice their opinion, to voice their concern, to voice their pain. And that's what the president is going to consistently do. He's a president for all Americans, obviously. Uh, as it relates to the State of the Union, I'm, not, I'm just not going to get ahead of any specifics uh, on what he's going to say as it relates to that question. Okay. Uh, thanks, Green. So Cookie Monster posted on X that shrinkflation uh, is making his cookies smaller. The White House official uh, twi uh, Twitter or X responded uh, that blaming shrinkflation basically on companies. So does the president again believe that shrinkflation and inflation are solely a company problem or do his policies play any role in that? So uh, also for my tweet, I believe we said C is, is for consumers getting ripped off. Right. And uh, and the president, the president has called on on uh, companies to to stop uh, to stop, uh, you know, uh, taking advantage of Americans. He's been very clear about that. Uh, he's repeatedly called on large co corporations, more specifically, to pass along uh, their uh, savings onto their customers. We've said that. We've been very consistent about that. And that includes ripoffs such as shrinkflation. We see that. And uh, where the size of a product, for those who don't know, uh, gets smaller even as the price stays the same or increases. That's what we've been seeing. Uh, and so it's giving families less 
uh, bang for their buck. And the president has said, and I'll quote him, tired of being, the president said, Americans are tired of being played for suckers. And so the president's going to have the, the American people's back. That's what he's going to continue to do. He's going to talk about this, uh, not just shrinkflation, but other ways uh, that he sees corporations are ripping off Americans. You're going to hear from him shortly about the, uh, about the, uh, what he's doing next to, to, uh, to deal with junk fees. And I think that's really important. That's what Americans want to see. They want to see their president fighting on their behalf. And out of that competition, Council the President is announcing that strike force. Why did it take the cookie monster to speak up or an election year for this strike force to go? Why not do it year, a couple years ago when was 9%. I, don't, I disagree with the premise of your question there. It, it did not take the cookie monster. Uh, if anything, it feels like the cookie monster is responding to us and what we've been saying about for sure inflation. I can't believe I'm having a conversation about the cookie monster at the podium. Um, but that is where, but that is, but that is, but that, <laughs> that's a good one. I'm glad you're awake. I'm glad you woke up for me. I know you were nodding off in the back earlier. but. Um, uh, but why did, it take, why did it take so long to announce a strike force? I mean, when look, inflation was here's, 9%? I, well, here's the thing. The, the President's Competition Council has been going, going on for some time now, right? He has taken this very seriously and finding ways to lower costs for the American people as we are obviously dealing with inflation, right? Obviously dealing with that because of what we uh, are coming out of with the, with the pandemic. So the President has taken actions. He's going to continue to do that. Uh, I would say the strike force is just another way along of many other announcements that this President has made in dealing with uh, large corporations uh, uh, ripping off Americans, right? And dealing with how do we get rid of junk fees. And so that's what you're going to hear from the, from the President. So to say that, you know, now all of a sudden he cares about this is not true. It is a false premise. It's a false question because the president has been dealing with this for some time now. And now he's making a new announcement uh, on, on the strike force. And I think it's important. And so you'll hear more from him uh, momentarily. Uh, one more, if I may. Uh, the president, I noticed, had, had note cards at the border when he was doing his uh, briefing there. He also had note cards uh, last Friday with the uh, Italian prime minister. Why does the president rely so heavily on note cards? You're upset because the president has note cards? Not you're upset. you're asking, asking me a why? question about the president having note cards? I'm asking why the does he rely so heavily? The president who has had a probably one of the most successful first three years of, of an administration than any modern day president. He's done more in the first three years than most presidents who had two terms. You're asking me about note cards? I don't think that's, I don't think, I don't, wait, I'm, I'm not speaking to you right now, James. I'm talking to, I'm talking to your friend over here, Ed. So thank you so much. But thank you so much for interjecting. Go ahead, Ed. I was just asking why, why he relies so heavily on note cards. I think what's important here and what the American people care about is how this president is delivering for, for them. And that's what he's doing. And that's what's the most important thing here. All right, I'm going to take, I'm going to take, okay. Did well, I call on you already? You did. Okay, but wait, no, 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 I can't do that. Good, Karen. No, no, no. <laughs> Good, Karen. Good, Karen. Good, Karen. Good, Karen. Uh, Alexei Navalny's widow, Yulia, was invited to the State of the Union by the White House, um, but she's unable to make it. Did the President extend that invite personally when he met with her last so, month? Yes, I can, I can confirm that she was indeed invited to the State of the Union. She is no longer able to attend. I would have to refer you to her uh, and her people on, as to specifically why, but I can confirm that, yes, she was invited. Did extend that invitation? Yes, the President did. When they met? Yes, the President did. <laughs> go ahead, John. Go ahead, John. Go ahead, John. John, go ahead. Go ahead, John. The president recently said that he'd be open to meeting with the House Speaker in regards to that Ukraine funding bill. Uh, is there anything to report? Is the president reaching out to the House Speaker uh, in terms of a one on one conversation? Well, they just met, the Big Four just met last week. They talked about the importance of obviously the National Security Supplemental, which includes the Ukraine funding. Uh, they talked about obviously uh, avoiding a shutdown, which we are glad to see that uh, Congress is doing that. And as you know, they had a pull aside, they had a brief meeting afterwards, not going to get into what was discussed. It was a private meeting, but the president has spent some time uh, with the speaker over, I mean, just, just last week, literally, they were together just last week. I don't have anything else to share. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. Um, go ahead. Thanks, Karine. Uh, is the White House concerned about another... Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, I'm more so teasing. I'm giving it a hard time. Go ahead. Is the White House concerned about another bank failure after New York Community Bank shows signs of trouble? 
So, look, uh, obviously, I, I want to be super careful, right? This is something that is monitored uh, by uh, by regulators, and this is something that we take very that they take very seriously and are always monitoring. I don't want to get ahead of that, and uh, we're always going to keep an eye on on. Uh, on that, or they will, uh, more, more, or more specifically, regular, regular leader, regulators. Uh, I just don't have anything else to share beyond that. All right. In the vein of that question about <laughs> yes, the yes, speaker, yes, yes, one sir. of mine was he did last week extend a bipartisan olive branch to the former president to work with him on border security. Beyond saying that rhetorically, has there been any other attempt to reach him? To talk about possibly working together, have you heard from the Trump camp about it? Uh, well. It, it, as it relates to the Trump camp or campaign, that's something that I would refer you to the campaign on. Look, the president has been very clear, and I think you've seen it in his action. The fact that we worked with Republicans to try and get to a border security uh, proposal, we did that because we believe it needed to be dealt with in a bipartisan way. And I would add that when, when we are able to um, work in a bipartisan way in a, in a, uh, on behalf of the American people, we get things done, right? We see that with the Chips and Science Act. We saw that with the uh, prevent uh, gun violence legislation, right? Anti-gun violence legislation. You saw that with the infrastructure uh, legislation. Remember last last time around during the last four years of the of the, of the last administration, it was a punchline. Infrastructure, you know, week was a punchline. Last week, there's been no active attempt to get the form. I don't have. I I am saying to you, I don't have anything to read out. But I do want to say, when we work in a bipartisan way, we are able to get things done for the American people. We just are, and we see that. We see that with historic pieces of legislation that will change the lives of Americans for generations, which are incredibly important issues that majority of Americans care about, and I think that's important. I don't have anything to read out on any outreach. I would certainly refer you to the campaign on anything specific as it relates to the Donald Trump campaign. All right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, everybody.